Good morning, everybody. Just three blocks away from here today, there's another educational conference taking place, Education Nation, sponsored by NBC. And when I realized that these two conferences were just a mere three blocks away, I was thinking, why aren't we all sitting in one room? Because the theme of Education Nation this year is a strong focus on what it will take to transform our schools and inspire our schools with a strong emphasis on achievement and success. Here we're talking about building character, respect, peace, and understanding. Hopefully someday somebody will be inspired to bring us all together. Because the most important thing, I think, for our children is to bring that academic component together with affect if we're going to have truly a global society. And we need to begin with this in our homes, in our classrooms, in our schools, and in our universities. Then maybe we can transform peace in society. Today's conversation will focus on, on mobilizing society for peace building. And it's my privilege to introduce to you our distinguished panel. And our first speaker this morning is Dr. Johnston McMaster who is the lecturer and coordinator of Education for Reconciliation program from the Irish School of Ecumenics in Belfast. His doctorate is from Garrett Evangelical Theological in, uh, Seminary in Evanston. Dr. McMaster is an author and a co-author of many publications, including Communities of Reconciliation, Churches on the Edge, The Role of Religion in Making Peace and Reconciliation in Northern Ireland, and his most recent publication was A Passion for Justice, Social Ethics in the Celtic Tradition. Pleasure to introduce Dr. Johnston McMaster. Moderator, thank you for your introduction and thank you to the organizers of this conference for the invitation uh, to participate. It is a privilege and an honor to be here and to share in such a significant and important conference. Globalization is, I think, a relatively new word or idea for a new time. Information technology, greater communications and travel have now placed us in a global village. We are being shaped by a larger yet at the same time shrinking context. Politics are primarily geopolitics. Our social home and environment is planetary. Yet globalization is holding the local and the global together. The global is in the local and the local is in the global. And this is true of foods, cultures, faiths, politics, economics. We are having to learn to live not with one narrative, but many narratives, many stories, cultures, faiths, ideologies, and philosophies. We are immersed in a local global context, and that means a globalized way of seeing peace building and education. What I would like to say in this presentation is from a global perspective, even though the case study I will offer at the end is local. That does not mean that I believe that Ireland, where I'm from, is the centre of the universe. Though for three decades at the end of the 20th century, I sometimes thought we had that tragic privilege. An introverted narrative is negative, be it Irish, British, American, Canadian, or wherever. My Irish case study is informed and underpinned by global perspective and is therefore, I hope, a global story. I would also like to explore two key components of peace building which education, I believe, can address, indeed I believe must address, if humanity is to live at peace on the planet as well as with the planet. Peace building through education. In June of this year, Aung San Suu Kyi visited Europe, eventually made the acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize. She is a woman who has suffered greatly, remains committed to nonviolence, 
and is a champion for democracy in her own country. She reminds us that peace building is about building democracy, which is essential to sustainable peace. Just over two decades ago, many of us sat glued to the television screen. The image is indelible, that of Nelson Mandela finally emerging from his Robben Island prison. He walked to freedom to lead with others the transformation of apartheid South Africa into a rainbow nation. It is still a work in progress. Mandela has reminded us that peace building is the creation of a pluralist, participative democracy. Peace building is pro-democracy, and it is about actively creating rainbow nations and societies, pluralist, participative democracies, at least. And education has a crucial role to play in all of this. There is, of course, the contribution of Fethullah Gulen, the Turkish Muslim philosopher, theologian, and activist. His holding an inclusive, universalist, and transcending Islamic perspective. His movement resulting, as you know, in schools integrating not only ethno-religious differences, but integrating scientific education and value-based education. And here is the reminder that education is crucially important, not only to educate for democracy, but as a means of forming and shaping people into active participants in a more tolerant and peaceful society. Let me speak of education for pluralist democracy. Democracy is developing. There is no finished product, and there is no one model to be imposed universally, irrespective of contexts and cultures. It is not flawless. Winston Churchill once said that democracy is the worst of political systems, except for all the rest. Democracy is about freedom. What the promise of freedom and potential for democracy does induce is an almost universal abhorrence of tyranny. Dictatorships, totalitarian regimes, and fascist states do not last and do not satisfy the deepest longings and needs for freedom and participative belonging. Whatever past history, newly liberated nations usually more move towards democracy. In 1918, when Czechoslovakia was born, its president said, our whole history inclines us towards the democratic powers. And that was repeated in 1989-91. Education for pluralist democracy as part of peace building needs to engage history. Democracy has a lineage, a family tree, and young people and adults should be aware of it. I suppose the Greeks invented politics and began with their city-states. The polis needed governance, and there was a recognition of public good and shared public interest and common concerns. And over these issues, there could be argument, debate, discussion, decision, and policy-making. The assembly of citizens was known as the ecclesia, though it was far from being fully participative. It was only for wealthy males, people of power, excluded women, and certainly had no place for slaves and lower classes. Athenian democracy lasted for about 185 years. It had limited participation, and Plato even thought that democracy meant the rule of the incompetent. Democracy was forgotten for a millennium. I suppose European democracy owes more, perhaps, to the democratic practices of the Viking world. Popular assemblies enter European history in the 9th century in Sweden and Denmark. Iceland's National Assembly came into being in 930 CE. And long before England had such a democratic assembly, it existed in the Manx Assembly, the Isle of Man, a small island between Britain and Ireland with a Viking history. The, Man the Manx Tinvald, or assembly, is also 9th century. Wherever the Vikings went, Nordic democracy went with them. In the modern era, the two great shapers of democracy were the French Revolution and the American Revolution. 
And any education in pluralist democracy needs to be aware of these seismic events. The history of the 18th, 19th century Europe was a history of wars and conflict, absolutist monarchies and imperialist powers. The first political revolution of a new time in European history happened outside of Europe and it led to the dissolution of the first British Empire. It began in 1773 with the Boston Tea Party and a decade later at a Paris peace conference, American independence was recognised. Now the people of North America could, as someone has said, work out their problems virtually untroubled by foreign intervention, a blessing to much that was to follow. Popular sovereignty was embodied in the opening words of the Constitution, we the people. All governments derive their just powers from the assent of the governed. And the American Revolution was a landmark in world history. Then followed the French Revolution, and by 1789, notwithstanding the terror, and not excusing the terror, great reforms were achieved. Described in this way, and I quote, the formal abolition of feudalism, legal privilege, and theocratic absolutism, and the organization of society on individualist and secular foundations were the heart of the principles of 89, distilled in a declaration of the rights of man and citizen legal equality, and legal protection of individual rights, the separation of church and state, and religious tolerance were their institutional expression. The derivation of authority from popular sovereignty, acting through a unified national assembly before whose legislation no privilege of locality or group could stand. So modern democracy was born and by 1900, the principle of democracy was an idea, albeit still resented in some parts of Europe, whose time had come, though it was to rise and fall before rising again. An education process needs to engage with the historical development of democracy, not only these, but other models also. We may sometimes have little consensus about its essence and it remains flawed in practice. We, the people, may even be impossible, strictly speaking, in practice. But democracy as a theory of governance and the ordering of the public good has promoted, as someone has put it, all the virtues from freedom, justice and equality to the rule of law, the respect for human rights, and the promotion of political pluralism and of civil society. Now, democracy is not amoral. It implies a need to be underpinned by a value system, and values and ethics are the foundation of democracy at work. And education, not only in the history of democracy, is important. So, too, is education and values and ethics. Peace-building is an ethical task, it needs democracy and the values and ethics that underpin democracy. Democracy involves pluralism and freedom. It also requires tolerance or respect. The education process needs to draw the distinction between passive tolerance and active tolerance. The former is the tolerance of indifference. The latter, in the words of a South American the attitude of one who positively co-lives with the other because one respects the other and accepts the multifaceted richness of reality. At the heart of any education is, is to, in, for democracy is justice, especially justice as distributive and restorative. Democracy is for human social flourishing and distributive and restorative justice our core to peace building. I turn now to education for global citizenship. Yale historian Jay Winter believes that a new kind of vision emerged at the end of the dark 20th century after the momentous, momentous events of the late 1980s and early 1990s. It is a vision set in the framework of globalization 
which aims to create a new kind of politics called the politics of global citizenship. It has also been described as globalization from below. In Winter's words, global citizens are emerging out of an array of transnational social forces animated by environmental concerns, human rights, hostility to patriarchy, and the vision of humane community based on the unity of diverse cultures seeking an end to poverty, oppression, humiliation, and collective violence. A new kind of political consciousness is developing, which is transnational and is flowing across national boundaries. It is a global movement holding together the local and global. In Winter's words again, global citizenship is a political project helping people to imagine a different kind of world. Citizenship is not tied to the state. It is, quote, participation in a transnational set of struggles for dignity and justice. The nation state is no longer in this kind of world primary. We are, not, we are no longer just Irish, American, Turkish, or Indian citizens, but global citizens in a different and larger solidarity on environmental rights, women's rights, and human rights. Transna transnational citizenship is about all of these global justice issues, none of which is limited by national boundaries. Community now is in the local and the global. Perhaps this began for many of us as children when we put our name and address on the inside page of a school textbook. Name, street, town, city, Ireland, Europe, the world, the universe. It is now the reality in a globalized world. Transnationalism and global citizenship may still have an unmapped future, but like modern democracy at the beginning of the 20th century, this new local global reality is and will shape who we are in the 21st century. It will be a peace-building project stretching us well beyond any introverted narrative. Citizenship education now needs to be global for all ages, and it is not only an alternative to introverted narratives, but also to economic globalization as a sole determinative factor for human and environmental life on the planet. I turn finally to what I've called a global case study. I currently work on an initiative called Ethical and Shared Remembering. It is an initiative which will respond to the centenaries of events that occurred in Ireland between 1912 and 1922 and which shaped the rest of the 20th century for the people of Ireland. It was a decade of enormous political change, ending with the partition of Ireland in 1922, and it was also a decade of brutal violence. Now, how the centenaries will be handled, and the first takes place this Saturday, how the centenaries will be handled between 2012 and 2022 will shape the decades ahead for better or worse. Ethical remembering is an approach that is critical in relation to the militarization of politics and the violence that was so deeply embedded in our culture and practice. Shared remembering is an approach that encourages the protagonists in all their complexity to engage with each other as human beings and to understand better each other's perspective or perspectives on this crucial Irish decade and its legacy. The legacy has left many issues unresolved, which have been replayed in, in a more recent phase of violence and conflict in Ireland at the end of the 20th century. Some of these issues are nationalism, nation state, faith and politics, faith and violence, class and labor relations, 
feminism and equality issues, trauma and peace building. These constitute for any educational program a generational peace building agenda which needs to be set in a global or global context. There are, and this is true of other places, there are multiple Irish narratives from this decade. And not only will this initiative try to recover them, especially the alternative repressed or forgotten narratives, but the events of 100 years ago will be carefully set in the larger global, at least European, context of that time. The memory of the Irish narratives has often been introverted, but this community education initiative will seek to provide a larger and more critical perspective on a century ago by placing the events in a more global context. Early 20th century imperialism and the catastrophe of the Great War provide a larger and rather different perspective. The framework for an educational exploration will not only include global contextualization, but also narrative hospitality. This is about generosity of spirit and openness to engage with multiple narratives, especially those of one sectarian or the, what is perceived as the other sectarian tradition or narrative perspective. Narrative hospitality will also include narrative pluralism and narrative flexibility. These latter two approaches will encourage an openness to recognize that there, there are multiple histories, multiple Irish histories, and diversities of interpretation of historical events and never a fixed or a final form. It is openness to realize that history is a plethora of interpretations, little of which may be about what actually happened, even if that ever can be fully known. Another educational framework will be integrative complexity. This is also getting beyond mon mono-narrative or mono-truth, simplism or fundamentalist politics or religion. Integrative complexity or IC is a way of seeing history, culture, politics, faith, the world, in all their diversity and complexity, and integrating or weaving together the complexities of personal, communal, and historical existence, and to see this complexity in the other. Key to this project will be the development of critical thinking skills in a community where there has been, through the dynamics of violence and conflict, a culture which is largely unquestioning. To question has often been understood as being disloyal or unpatriotic. And few people have thought for themselves, maybe. And this educational methodology will, will engage with critical reflection on matters of history, politics, religion, and cultural identity without reducing their complexity. Essential to the educational exploration of the past will be future visioning. This is not just about a 2030 vision for Ireland. It is about transcending local nationalist politics of whatever shade and visioning a common good. It will also be about global citizenship a transnational vision that will require the imaginative creation of a larger identity myth beyond introversion and global in perspective and complexity. Not only will the initiative encourage the development of an ethical vision for future society, but will also unpack the need for ethical leadership in a society where the moral authority of the major institutions in Ireland has collapsed. The initiative is being delivered through community education programs, dialogue events, training resources and materials, and a series of in-depth publications and also the use of the arts. The community of ethical and shared remembering will include people from the community development and community relations sector, 
education, youth, the faith sector, politicians, ex-political prisoners, commemorative groups and institutions. This is an initiative which we hope, we hope will make a positive contribution through education to peace building as a global task. It will hopefully mean the difference between being history makers rather than merely history commemorators, ethical leaders rather than gatekeepers. Moderator, thank you. <laughs>